Hello. Hello, folks. Hello and welcome. Good morning, where I am in the world. Uh, yeah. I am currently, I'm Catherine, uh, and I'm currently in Los Angeles, California. Where are you? <laughs> I'm Hakan. I'm the other half of Thorny Games, and I'm in wonderful, sunny Washington, D.C. So. Oh, I'm glad to hear it's sunny. That's great to hear. It's, it's, um, uh, it's not actually very sunny. but <laughs> <laughs> We're starting off this with lies. but. <laughs> Um, well, we both have our coffee, so mm -hmm. I think we intend this to be a, a coffee-filled morning of discussion. And we're here uh, to chat about co-design. Uh, this uh, particular section is called Co-Design, the Roses and Thorns of Making Things Together. I'm going to read the prompt for us, which will frame the rest of our interaction. Making things together is very hard, but it is also the very best. Co-design allows you to create something that wouldn't be possible on your own. Along the way, you need to navigate creativity and decision-making while setting up a way for people of different tastes, expertise, and life experience to contribute. So as a conversation together, we're gonna share about our co-design experiences as a studio and the adventures at Roses and Thorns we've had along the way. Um, and in particular, oh, sorry. Um, and in particular, we're also going to talk a lot about uh, the Aphasia Games for Health project, which was a, a co-design project that we had where uh, Thorny Games collaborated with a number of game design academics and uh, folks with aphasia uh, to help design games um, to help in the aphasia recovery process. Yeah, we'll use that as a great uh study to prompt our discussion and uh, to share what we've learned. But we'd also really welcome questions. But I have a question to start off with, um, which I will pose to the both of us. Uh, and I really welcome your answers to this too. If you had to co-design something with an animal, which animal would it be? And what would you make? I'm happy to go first because clearly this is a high stakes <laughs> question. <laughs> In this high stakes question, um, my answer on reflection is that I would co-design something with a very particular cat named Bonbon, bon, who is one of uh, our two cats. Bonbon uh, bon is an orange tabby uh, and we would make an escape room together. Bonbon bon really lives uh, his life to cuddle and to be cozy. And I think that Bonbon bon and I would have a lot of insight together in making a cozy escape room where you could imagine sitting in a beam of sunlight is what unlocks uh, a key to open. So then you could get access to a couch where you have to find the exact place to cuddle, which would then open a trapped door. And these series of cuddle cozy puzzles would just uh, end up in the end at treats. Uh, which is the only logical place for it to be, I feel like. Uh, that's my uh, immediate <laughs> top animal collab. What about for you, Hakon? Yeah, so um, I was thinking about this a little bit. I think mine would be with a beaver um, because, you know, one of the interesting things about code design is kind of the the thought that the person that you're working with, like, has these... Uh, emotional kind of needs and like drives that are actually like dictating how they're thinking about the process that like you might just not have right and i think of animals that have just the most like arbitrary instinctual kind of urges and drives to do something very very specific i don't know i think of beavers and building like dams and stuff so uh i don't know i think that would be like an interesting thing to to explore, like how we could how we could make a make a game about uh, building a dam together. I love that, and uh, now I Did also you have runners imagining... up in yours. Oh, definitely, definitely. I will get to those in a second. <laughs> but the uh, but to linger on the beaver moment, uh, I'm also thinking about sort of where that could fall in the let's say more human like and more beaver like space, where you can imagine mm -hmm. sort of what would a beaver make of a Lego set mm -hmm. versus you know, what would, you know, your input be to a that's, nature made dam? Yeah, no, I think that's fair. Uh, I do think that on the slider of like how beaver like or how human like the co-design product is going to be, it's going to probably end up being pretty beaver like uh, in terms of like <laughs> which one of the uh, parties is going to give more than the other one <laughs> in terms of 
in making this uh, a full product. But um, but yeah, I would like to know what the roses with Legos. I kind of have a feeling I, I I know the answer to the question, but uh, <laughs> yeah, be good um, the other thing I have to say, just to linger on this point even more, is that uh, we are a game to studio that makes uh, games often about communication, and I feel like there would be such amazing collab possibilities to think about human and animal communication, interspecies communication. Uh, clearly, I'd want to do that with elephants, birds, cows, everything, but um, natural fit in tie in with our studio, which uh, follows to the next question. Maybe we should give intros. Um, Hakan, <laughs> who are you and what is your background in games? <laughs> who are you? Uh, so my name is Hakan. Um, Kate and I started making games um, probably like five, six years ago by now, something like that, when we first formed Thorny Games together. Um, and uh, before that, I was a mathematician and cryptographer, and then I went to Silicon Valley and did some um, uh, engineering there. And then um, while I was doing that, at some point, I got really into board games. And then Kate had gotten us tickets to go to Gen Con, and we discovered indie games on demand there and discovered story games and really fell in love with them. Um, and so we made a couple games uh, and we could start at them. Uh, they're mainly about language. Um, and they did really, uh, pretty nicely. And so we uh, have just been exploring that and uh, digging deeper into that rabbit hole ever since. So, and, uh, and for the last year and a half, I've been in DC doing uh, different tech policy work here. So, um, but Kate, uh, who are you? <laughs> uh, I am Kate, uh, and I uh, also make games with Hakan as a part of Thorny Games, which is our studio. Uh, and I uh, have always been a playful person, interested in board games, uh, immersive theater, things like it. And yeah, we've really found a home in indie tabletop uh, and also at Big Bad Con, where we have uh, met a huge community of people that inspire us and uh, help us to become better game designers. So it's such a pleasure to be able to be part of Big Bad Con online. Yes, um, because before coming to DC, we were Bay Area based, and so Big Bay Con was our home con. Yes, yes, it still is the home con in my heart. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, my background is as a linguist, a computational linguist, where I have also worked in technology for a while, and uh, then um, as a game designer as part of our studio, and then. Um, in Washington, D.C., going to be doing things with uh, humanitarian tech very soon. But back to co-design. A question for the both of us, I pose. What is co-design? What does it mean? Uh, I can start. Uh, sure. The way that, that I think of co-design simply is making things together where you share decision making in some way and where you have a more direct power relationship over what the final product is. And it's a little different than other kinds of making things where you'd imagine that uh, in certain scenarios, you ask for a lot of input, you collaborate with uh, many different people, but when you have a named co-design relationship, you're really uh, going into it with the idea that this will be the product sensibilities and reflection decision making of multiple people. I think that's right. And one of the things that I think helps clarify how we're thinking about it too, and really what makes it kind of different in our situation than you know, maybe you might think of, um, you know, a lot of designers working together at like a AAA game studio or something like that, is that the co-design context that, I, that we're mainly talking about are ones where everyone there has a large degree of creative control over the end product too, right? Um, where really it's the people engaged in the co-design process together who are defining what the thing is going to be. You're not implementing kind of a set vision, but instead everyone has a fundamental say in the artistic kind of um, 
end product that's coming out there. Not to say that people don't have that input in bigger studios too, but a lot of times there's you know, more frameworks that are put in place um, that people are working to implement uh, effectively and graphically. Whereas here, you know, what we're actually making is kind of up for grabs amongst the different co-designers. And so that's a tension that needs to be kind of navigated and balanced uh, during the process as well. Absolutely. And we'll talk more about frameworks for how to collaborate, because even when you aren't as big as a AAA studio, when you get uh, any people together in a room with different instincts, tastes, backgrounds, sensibilities, there's some way that you need to figure out how to have these conversations and ultimately drive towards a decision. And sometimes that can happen organically and chaotically just through the uh, relationship of people working closely together, or sometimes you need to be a little more uh, intentional about it. And when we talk about our uh, aphasia games for health collaboration and that co-design team, we'll look at a couple of the tools that we use there to help with co-design. One question I have for you uh, is that, uh, and I'm happy to start on this too, is just that I'm wondering if you think that there's a, a parallel in co-design between jamless games. We at our studio are really drawn to making jamless games or GM full games. These are games where there isn't one party that has dominion control over the story and what happens, but instead it's this uh, apportioning of input control shaping from different people who can come together through a rule set to make a story that no one person has a greater vision over. And often it's something that they're discovering together live at a table. I, I think there is and there isn't, right? Like there's there's ways in which it's similar in terms of like it being a joint product that you're all making together. But I think the, the major part that's different than the major part that is a challenge when co-designing too is the fact that at the end of the day, this is something that your name and reputation is going out into the world with, right? This thing that would not be how you would have made it if you were working alone. For better or worse, usually for worse, right, is is now <laughs> out there. Um, but, you know, in terms of how it comes out there, your name and reputation is tied to every decision that went into the game, even ones that you probably disagreed with. And with the, when you're playing a game, uh, you know, you're collaboratively making some something and everyone has kind of roles into the creative process that are defined through the system itself. But it's not like, um, you know, people won't be judging you based on the end product, uh, based on decisions that potentially you did make or you disagreed with. And I think that's one of the, so I think that's an illustrative kind of thing to, to think about because it helps define some of the really challenging parts of code design. Um, right. But uh, what, how do you think about that uh, contrast? I think it's a great, uh, yeah, I think it's a great point in that I, uh, you still retain, uh, I guess, your individual contribution in a more direct uh, way as a part of the process of playing a game that is a, a GMless game. And I think that there is some parallel in the sense that GMless games are really trying to empower different people with different uh, story inclinations, like natural instincts uh, to collaborate together. And some of those systems are the same flavor or the, the, the same, I guess, spirit that's going into actually making something together. But I agree with you that ultimately when you have made something together, it becomes the, the product of both people. And, okay. uh, and you really need to um, be enthusiastically, uh, ideally okay with, with the way that uh, things turn out. Yeah, and it's just a different scope of like how serious the thing you're making is too, right? Like if you if you go to bat for a creative decision that you disagree with in the in the game you're playing together, right? Like that's not cool, right? Like, you, should, <laughs> like you, you you shouldn't be in a situation where you're like really second guessing someone else's judgment. But there could be situations in the co-design process where 
it is your responsibility to disagree with somebody, right? Uh, for the good of the project and for really the good of the thing that's coming out with their name on it too. Um, and that expectation that you'll represent what you think is the best decision, even if someone else might disagree with it, right? The fact that you're willing to have those hard conversations, I think is something that is really important for the co-design process. Yep. And that is something that makes it so powerful and vulnerable at the same time, because you end up needing to have these deep, creative, uh, you know, well-intentioned uh, conflicts with one another. And you're doing that for your respect and responsibility together to the whole project. And I think when people come into a co-design relationship, knowing that that is uh, a part of it, then uh, there it can still be tricky, but, you know, you get you get through it, you get past it, and you see where uh, where it ends you in ideally a better place. Uh, and then you repeat and go. And uh, and then you know you also have the maturity and shared experience of what it is to have those kinds of conversations together. Uh, that then really deep in a relationship, it's not a, a superficial interaction anymore. You know you, you're being really honest with each other, which is powerful. Definitely, because I, I, I also think that some of the worst collaborative experiences you can have sometimes is when the person you're collaborating with just takes every suggestion you make, right, and and puts it directly into the project without, you know, challenging or, you know, really taking ownership about those things that are going into the game, too. Where it's like, oh, I think that character creation should happen this way, for example. And they're like, okay, cool, let, let's do that, right? Um, yeah. And suddenly that becomes something that like you came up with and forced into the game rather than something that like both people bought into and really kicked the tires on and really are willing to stand behind at that point. Um, and I think a lot of times when you're designing together, you know, people will think that it's being accommodating to their design partner to take their suggestions and the things that they're saying and, you know, to, to, to work with them, to put them in, to, to accept them. Um, but there is still a balance there that has to happen. Like, it's your responsibility if you're on the project that you are, you, know, you feel good and you are willing to stand behind everything that goes into the game, even if that decision came from someone else, because you know you, you disagree with, you talk to them, you, you gave them a chance to convince you, right? You really tried to get somewhere, and then um, if at the end you still disagree, then you know you're going to have to pick a uh, direction and go with it. But at least you've really gotten to that point uh, and had those conversations. Yeah, because I could imagine that the oh, well, one of the unhappy scenarios would be getting to the end of something and actually having a product that neither of you feel connected to, uh, or none of the co-designers feel connected to, or or deep ownership or reflection of, because of just how it has become a hot potato in this process that has been Frankenstein through um, not having these harder conversations. Yeah. Or yeah. you discover really late into it that like, oh, okay, this part that like I had suggested didn't really work. And then the other co-designer is like, oh, well, I just put it in because like, that's what you thought would work. And it's like, oh, mm. great. Like, uh, <laughs> I really wish if you had low confidence in it, that like you had told me and like we had, we had worked on it because, you know, if you're going into it, you need to be I'm open to, to having these conversations to, to make it better. And if if your co-designer isn't, then I think you're going to have many, many challenges going forward on it. Um, that makes sense. One question that I have really as a follow up is thinking about whether or not the fact that playtesting is such a big part of game making uh, can change what the co-design relationship is versus imagining co-design in other domains, right? Like I might make something together with somebody in a kitchen and we're tasting it along the way, but ultimately it's just presented at the end to a group of people or uh, projects that I know, at least in my working life, uh, that aren't put in front of people so regularly. I think like the idea that in game co-design, especially in the way that we co-design, we're Playtesting is such a fundamental part of what happens at every step of the way. So it means that there's this external feedback that you're getting on ideas as they're being made uh, and formed and matured all the time. And then there's the separate uh, 
a relationship among co-designers of actually sorting through feedback from other people. Uh, and uh, I think the idea of having to show your work and then getting other people's input as a basic part of what success means, of, about what making something fun means and, and making a design that, that works for other people, uh, that changes the co-design relationship in the context of games versus what it may mean to make things with other people in other domains. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Um, because there is that process of continual feedback along, along the way, but also like it is still very messy too, right? Because those play tests, right, are still completely up to interpretation by the by the people who are running it together. So it's still, you know, games being some uh, either art or some variant of art. I don't know how we would really talk about it. Um, but uh, given that there is some like artistic value in what you're making, right? Like how players are reacting to it, it's still going to be something that you need to subjectively quantify. Um, so it's not like you can just say like, oh, okay, you had this idea, I had this idea, we're gonna put both of them in front of people and see which one they prefer. Chances are both ideas are going to have pluses and both ideas are going to have minuses in those situations. It's rarely as simple as just being able to put two things in front of people and, and seeing which one they like. So there's still a lot of like, you know, subjective quantification that has to go into the process of, you know, how, what, what do you actually make of this play test? But I see we got a couple questions in the chat too, if you want to go Ooh. through any of those. Kate. Yeah, um, fun. So one of them that I see uh, William Post is, so much of design is saying no to things. What has been the most challenging no you've faced in a game you've created? Hmm. What a good question. No. The thing that actually comes to mind for me is really uh, whether or not to pursue a game it's and, and whether or not to take on a new game design. There's been a number of things that we have tried or been interested in, and uh, they're so exciting. You get this new idea. Uh, I remember at one point we were working on a game that was using chess as a, a basic part of exploring a story of I uh, sort of the musical chess equivalent yeah, of chess imagining in both the game and the musical sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is um uh in the uh sort of Soviet uh American political geopolitical tensions that were um a part of the Cold War as focused on chess the game and we we're exploring that and playing with it because we really loved the idea of adding story and narrative elements to established board game design. And also we're interested in that bigger subject matter. Uh, and uh, it was intriguing, but I think ultimately we said no because, or I remember saying no, one, because it felt like it was a distraction from other ideas that felt more pressing. And it just didn't feel like that there was a single thing there that really sung, like it was gonna capture uh, my attention, maybe our attention, uh, that could uh, really withstand all of the energy and labor that goes into ultimately making something into a real thing. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. I think for me, the most challenging though has been like around some of the collaborations we've done outside of our studio itself, where like some projects just don't get off the ground because of organizational difficulties that the other folks might be having internally. Um, and those are situations where like a co-design process can fail, um, but not because of the working relationship. Right? There are just many external factors as to why a project might have challenges. And I think that it's usually, especially just for someone like me, who I think tends to, like, if there's anything going wrong, I tend to blame myself uh, for <laughs> the, the failings in it. Um, it's really hard not to blame yourself when a collaboration like that fails sometimes. Um, and so, but like whenever you think about it objectively, it's very easy to kind of write down all the outside reasons for why the project may have had challenges, but still separating that out and kind of blaming the co-design process and your input, your creative input into it can be a very hard trap to avoid. And I think that's been one of the more challenging things for me is to be able to separate the two. 
Yeah, that makes sense. And just yeah, as a word of context, our studio works with nonprofits, works with universities, works with other studios to make things uh, together uh, when projects come up and there is a, an interesting opportunity and funding for it. And yeah, it can be really heartbreaking when everyone is well-intentioned and wants to make a thing, but it just isn't right for the broader context of what it is for these uh, you know, people and entities and organizations coming together. Oh, we have one more. Next I question. Think. Yeah. Do you always fall into certain roles in addition to being designers? Like, does one person lean towards project management, another towards marketing, etc.? cetera? Um, we have uh, in our studio different strengths as people that we uh, often think about. Um, sometimes we talk about what gives us energy and what really takes energy away. And I think we try and do some balancing on those things, especially when they're different. Uh, and um, then there are things that take energy from both of us versus and give it away. And I think that our studio is probably, uh, you know, worse off for, for not having that, you know, someone actually being able to represent that. I'm thinking of uh, social media in particular, which is not a, a strength or delight of either one of us. Uh, but um, but we we do uh, fall into more common roles. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, there have been times where one of us is is more deeply focused on what's happening at the studio, uh, either by being full time on it or by being sort of the named person that is uh, running uh, sort of day to day operations. And that has switched up given just how uh, life evolves and opportunities and uh, interests. Yeah, I think that's right. Like Kate was saying, I think a lot of times we'll shuffle who's actually in charge of what. Um, and when Thorn Games itself, based on what's going on outside uh, of, the, of the game studio, because uh, you know, we're, we, we love what we do. It's not quite enough to, to support two people working on it full time perpetually. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we've, we've shuffled who kind of has outside jobs and things like that and that requires a lot of um you know the shuffling around of, of responsibilities so that's generally how we determine that i think we have one more question uh, and then we'll get to uh the uh co-design uh case study that we want to cover i know you've been working on ways to get xeno language to work for virtual tabletop how has that process been going so you can see some recordings of it, I think, on YouTube uh, already, or I think there were some on the Kickstarter page too. Um, there was, uh, it, it works well. Uh, we had to think of how to exactly make, uh, so for folks who might not be aware, Zeal Language is our game that had uh, Kickstarted uh, that we're currently in the process of fulfilling. Where one of the central mechanics uh, is a, a Ouija board-like channeling mechanism where you uncover uh, the meanings of these alien symbols that you're channeling over as the game goes on, right? And so that's how you communicate with the aliens of the story. Um, as you can imagine, that's not something that's terribly easy to uh, 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 implement uh, virtually, um, but we were able to use um, some of the tools in Tabletop Simulator specifically because I had a software engineering background to essentially make something that worked as a channeling board um so where you could hover over different things um we don't quite know how to make that work on platforms that aren't uh that don't have the same scripting uh controls that that platform does at the moment but that's something that we've been actively working on too but but yeah feel free to check it out yeah. um it took a lot of uh lua scripting to make work so <laughs> And enabled a lot of playtesting in the yes. pandemic as well. I mean, that's why we did um, it it's the first yeah. time. We, having a virtual way to play Xeno Language was not one of the main goals we had when we were making it. We always saw that as an in-person game, as you can tell, it was very component-centric. But then when the pandemic happened, obviously, in the middle of the development, we had to figure some way to all those playtests online. Yeah. We'll be playing a game of it with uh, some Italian friends uh, using the virtual tabletop uh, simulator uh, in the, the next coming weeks when we ourselves will be going to Italy um, as part of guests for uh, Modena Play. But now let's uh, switch to uh, 
our co-design slides. Thank you, uh, panel helpers. Uh, so one of the ways we thought about talking uh, about co-design that would be interesting is by going through a, a project that we were both part of that um, had a lot of co-designers and where co-design was really the heart of it. Sometimes we, I think sometimes when I think about co-design, I think about being motivated by wanting to, to design something with a particular person, either because I like their sensibilities or it's fun to collaborate. Um, and sometimes I think about co-design because I want to make something that is only possible with a group of people coming together who share different kinds of expertise. And I think that this is more of the latter. And that's especially interesting because you get a bunch of people who do different things, know different things, but really want to work together and um, ultimately make something that uh, hasn't been done in the way that, that we did it. So this is a uh, next slide. Not sure who's controlling slides. Great. Um, so uh, this is a project called Aphasia Games for Health. Uh, which, which had a co-design team, including all of those names that you see there. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, who these people are and their backgrounds in a moment, but you can see that there are many members of the, the co-design team who had input, creative control, and decision-making along the way. Um, but first, let's explain a little about what Aphasia Games for Health is. So uh, Aphasia is a... a is a communication issue where um, it's a struggle to communicate uh, in response to brain injury. Um, people with aphasia sometimes have difficulty communicating, difficulty writing, difficulty reading, uh, and it um, often is associated with um, stroke uh, and people who have had stroke. Uh, there are many people in the US that have aphasia, um, two plus million is estimated, and uh, it can affect a lot of areas of life. Um, a lot of times it is considered an invisible condition and doesn't get the kind of attention and resourcing that it deserves. And um, folks with aphasia often talk about um, having a lack of access to, to rehab as being a major challenge that they face. Um, they, uh, if they have healthcare coverage, um, will often only have extremely limited uh, sessions, availability, and support through that coverage that gives them access to speech language therapy, uh, and often only for the first parts of the first year. Uh, and um, for many people, aphasia can be a chronic condition. And so that means that they're thinking about recovery, navigating uh, their lives, and, uh, and thinking about you know, what it means to uh, be part of the systems and relationships that they are for the rest of their lives. And um, as a, a part of that, people are eager for new ways to think about making uh, rehab, uh, recovery, uh, and access to these things um, more available and uh, more engaging for the long term. Next slide, please. So why consider games for this reason? Games uh, are a, uh, they have a lot of properties that make them uh, particularly interesting when it comes to care and especially community-based care. One, games have been shown to be able to be therapeutic in that they can be designed around very specific mechanics that uh, echo uh, evidence-backed uh, behaviors that are part of rehab. They're flexible in format. They can be made available in person or online, and that can meet the environmental needs and conditions of people who want to play. Sometimes they can be cost effective or they can design to try to be cost effective uh, and, and more so than uh, maybe certain types of therapy. And they're engaging in that games are asking you to take part in social experiences and to be fun as one of the basic parts of what success is. And just to bring up one point too, one of the big things around uh, aphasia is the social isolation that comes with it, right? When you're not able to communicate. Um, you, know, you feel isolated from your friends, your family, all these people that you used to have very deep relationships with that you can't communicate with on a regular basis anymore. And so 
trying to think of games as an opportunity to to rekindle that engagement you know some activities you can do together with your family with your loved ones was something that really motivated games as a, as a format for what we were considering here as well so there was an opportunity and uh will evans who is a professor of uh, communication and speech therapy at the University of Pittsburgh really uh, saw this opportunity where what if you could make card-based games that are designed around a therapeutic foundation with the idea that they could be in service of people pursuing their own long-term recovery and care at home without the need of a clinician uh, and uh, made available for low cost uh, and used as a part of what uh, aphasia support therapy looks like. You know, can we use play as a form of community-driven care? Really interesting, intriguing idea that uh, was a part of a grant proposal that was then won um, the uh, Pitt Challenge, and that provided funding for putting together a group of people that would begin to tackle this. And so as part of that, you can imagine why, or you can ask the question, why do co-design here? Uh, and uh, you could certainly imagine one person trying to tackle this, but that uh, feels like that it really emphasizes where you would be missing out on so very much. Um, here, with all of the goals of this project, you really need different people uh, and to be able to kind of bring what they uh, know and are best at to come together to, to make something that wouldn't be possible in isolation. Um, so here, the idea is, can we bring together speech language pathologists who can help evaluate what are the therapeutic mechanics these games are based on, um, aphasia community members who can themselves contribute knowledge from their personal experiences with aphasia, represent sort of the broader community and bring their own sensibilities around play in the games that they're already playing. And then can you bring professional game designers who have experience in making playful systems at scale that can be connective tissue around all of these ideas and then ultimately produce something that is true to you know each of these charges that um, becomes a, a game based on therapeutic mechanics designed for and with people with aphasia so a co-design team was made uh, there were um speech language pathologists represented by the language rehab and cognition lab at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, aphasia Recovery Connection, which is a, a large aphasia support group based in the US, uh, contributed with a, a whole set of designers who themselves were eager to, uh, or were already playing games and were eager to be part of the game design process. Uh, and then a series of game designers both us as Thorny Games um, uh, and others. Um, what's interesting here is that uh, these different game designers contributed different things to this too. As Thorny Games, we were acting more as uh, project managers uh, and collaborators at a higher scale, sort of co-designing the co-design process. Um, Jessica Hammer from Carnegie Mellon University, uh, thinking about um, the games in research um, and applying research principles to how to make um, transformational games. And then uh, a set of game designers uh, who themselves were paired and uh, with the broader co-design team to lead particular designs uh, and, um, and then a uh, uh, and then ultimately produce game prototypes. So together, we uh, worked to produce three prototype games that incorporate a range of principles that uh, are things that we drew up as being the mission of what these games would do, and that they would use behavioral rehabilitation principles. We wanted them to be adaptive to different levels of difficulty, so uh, folks with different kinds of profiles and experiences with aphasia could play them, um, make space for performance feedback, which is a basic part of rehab in many contexts, Playable for the long term, the idea is you might be able to have a longer relationship with these games versus them being, let's say, a one-off puzzle. 
uh, and accommodate some common community constraints, which we learned by asking the community, doing surveys, and, and tapping into the uh, deep knowledge of um, our co-designers with aphasia and aphasia recovery connection. I think one note just to call out here about Games for Health is just to be careful about over-promising. You know, these really were prototypes, uh, and we know that there's a really long and a, high, a long road and a high bar to say that something is a medical intervention where you're doing clinical trials at scale. Um, this is the first step down a long road, but it is an exciting first step of getting all of these people together uh, to make things. And so one of the things that became very clear from the beginning, even before we started, is that we really needed to, des to design how we were going to co-design together. Uh, different people uh, as a part of this just had different experiences with game design, with aphasia, with speech language pathology. And so it was really a, a collaboration that wanted to bring out the best of everyone while still being able to navigate these tricky creative conversations that we've been talking about up to now. Um, and so in starting this, we planned some phases of design that would help get people on the same or a, a similar level of being able to actually start making things together. And, uh, and one of the things that was really core to this is that we sort of used the iterative process of, uh, of, of making uh, and of even making a game to think about how we were going to make our co-design process. Um, we gave feedback to each other uh, as time went on, what was working, what wasn't. We changed things, we added things, and ultimately at the end also did a big reflection on what it was like to co-design these games. And that reflection and the uh, collaboration overall resulted in a peer-reviewed paper that came out at Kai Play last year, um, a conference focused on computer-human interaction. And just to stress a few things about this process that was really important. Um, one of the trickiest things about this co-design process was the fact that you had game designers collaborate with people who weren't game designers and making a game, right? And so you have this process where you have people who are experts at the thing that you're making um, who don't have all the perspective they need to be able to effectively make it in this context. Still so collaborating with people who aren't experts, right, on the on the actual thing, which is you know how to design a game, and in a lot of those situations where that's the relationship, I think that the people who are not the experts at the thing that are that is actually being made, right, can have a very hard time, um, both having their voices heard in the design process, right? And making sure that's taken seriously and also giving the type of feedback that's actually helpful to the to the designers, right? And so that's why we actually had a very rigid structure in terms of how people, um, like what was concretely expected in terms of when will pitches be delivered? First, we had all the designers give three pitches each for their games. And then we had the folks with aphasia and the speech language pathologists evaluate each of them based on their criteria. People still work together all the time outside of that too. Um, but concretely, there was like certain decision points where the designers themselves had to turn over what they had and really have a very concrete place where the people who weren't the designers gave feedback and kind of had very explicit creative control over what was happening at that point, right? Because um, yeah. I think oftentimes people can think of these co-design processes of like, oh, great, we'll just get like three of these people together and like leave them alone for a month and they'll make something great at the end. And it's like, uh, that's not how it happens, right? Like, because someone who has an expertise or someone who is more, you know, um, in, not as confident in the value of their input or might just not know how to productively provide input for the thing that's being made um, won't might not actually have a very productive relationship in it and so we very explicitly had points where like now this person is in charge right now this person is giving the very concrete feedback that we as 30 games who weren't really in charge of delivering any prototype we were in charge of like making sure the ship ran um, was able to provide um, 
make sure that everyone was sticking to the responsibilities in that section um, so everyone could have um, you know, productive creative control over the final product. Right. And if you go to the next slide, One of the like, critical parts of this, too, is um, just empowering our co-designers with aphasia to be able to take active uh, engagement and, and be actively involved in the, the process. And given um, what aphasia is, there are communication difficulties that you need to be thoughtful about and that we were um, as a basic part of what it meant to make sure that people's voices and opinions were heard. Um, and one of the things that we did is one make use of the best practices that are already established as a part of aphasia support groups online where they do things like captioning. Um, we would meet over Zoom remotely, uh, one that made that accessible. It was also during the pandemic, so it was utterly necessary, but this ended up being a good thing under any context. Um, we were able to use live captioning at times uh, and captioning provided by different people who are part of the game design process to make sure that um, everyone uh, was able to uh, follow conversations and contribute. Um, that also happened with keywords and chat. We used images and communication support devices as much as possible when it came to thinking about prototypes and design um, as it was evolving through different uh, stages of design. And I think that um, these tools were helpful for everyone, but also made it so that um, there was communication among different mediums. So there was a very explicit um, set of uh, co-design um, behaviors and decisions that were made as a part of this process to make sure that everyone felt enfranchised and, and uh, you know, were able to, to contribute. And then the big thing also being regular feedback, asking people, you know, should we go slower? Should we think about um, thinking about, uh, sh should we go faster? Should we think about uh, whether or not um, we should meet for shorter periods of time, um, other times of day? Uh, and having that kind of open communication uh, enabled this process to happen. We have so much more that could be said about this uh, whole experience, and we've given other talks about it. If you're interested in the Aphasia uh, Games for Health project, you can go to um, aphasiagamesforhealth.com. Uh, there are three prototypes that came out uh, into the world and that are now actively being played by Aphasia support groups. We're really proud of this work and um, all of the folks that were key to making it happen. Um, but given that we only have two minutes left, now it is our time to do an outro. Let's close the slides. Great. All right. Yep. Um, yeah, I saw we had a, a couple of questions pop up. I don't know if we want to try to go through any of them in our two minutes, but one of the questions was, can... does do you want to try to speed run through them real quick? Sure. Okay. The first one was, does the only language draw anything from the aphasia project? Probably not, because most of the okay. language, the language was kind of like <laughs> 70, 80 percent design baked already when we were starting to work on that. But you know, subconsciously, probably in some ways. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was kind of already more or less baked by the time that that was getting off the ground. And then, how do you avoid overpromising when prototyping, especially in co-design? I'm imagining it's uh, somewhat like herding cats. Um, <laughs> That is challenging because uh, games, for some reason, are like the one artistic medium that like everyone assumes is super easy when it's not. Right? Because <laughs> you hear all these like companies and stuff that are just like, okay, we're going to like, our next step is going to be to like design a game, and we assign like the two people who work in our front office to like make a game about like this thing that we're doing. And it's like you would never like if if you were like going to make a movie or something and put it out, you'd never just like assign two people from the front office to like make a movie about the thing that you really care about. Um, so anyways, the, it, it's a very challenging problem, right? Uh, I think with this one, it was really good uh, because we kind of knew what was going on, like because we had been part of many like game design processes with external companies. And so we knew what people tend to expect and what they can like what a realistic end product was, we kind of were able to give that to people. 
uh, very quickly. Anyways, we're getting uh, the shepherd's crook uh, in the chat uh, pulling us <laughs> off stage. Uh, so we'll give our outros real quick. Uh, so it's wonderful talking to you folks. Uh, I'm Hakana Thorny Games. Uh, feel free to reach out if there's anything else that we can help answer. And hopefully that was we satisfactorily got through at least some portion of the questions. Okay. Yep, I'm Catherine, uh, also at Thorny Games. And uh, yeah, it was wonderful spending this morning chatting about co-design. We have lots of thoughts. Uh, if you have thoughts uh, in uh, in Discord, we'd love to hear them. And uh, you can find our games at thornygames.com. And uh, again, more about the um, Aphasia Games for Health project at aphasiagamesforhealth.com. Take care, folks. <laughs>